at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at gbnews. Our Twitter poll running now the results surely, but to help you make up your mind... We've got a firm net zero proponent. He is the conservationist and former MEP, Stanley Johnson. And tonight he's going head to head with the Professor of Economics at Edinburgh University, Gordon Hughes. Great to have you both here. Stanley Johnson, uh, doesn't the British public have a right to vote on a policy that is going to fundamentally change our way of life in the decades to come? I wouldn't have said so myself, and I am going to say so now. Why? The, um, this issue was put to the government because, as I recall, it's only it's a little less than a year ago, I think a petition was launched, and under some new proviso, when a certain number of, of people asked for, for something to be considered, the government has to give a view. And I did read the government's response... And I was rather impressed by it. And the government said, by the way, I'm not always impressed by what the government said, but this particular occasion, the government said, in our, quote-unquote, unwritten constitution, referenda are reserved for hugely important constitutional issues. That's that's the way we do things in this country. And I think there's a lot lot to be said for sticking to that line. It's not because I fear that a referendum would necessarily give the wrong result, but I just don't think it is the right way to approach this particular topic. Professor Gordon Hughes, you disagree. Why? Well, um, the Swiss are a relatively serious country and are very concerned about their environment, and they have managed to have a referendum on the main elements of their net zero policies. Um, In fact, they rejected them. That shows that it is perfectly possible to have a constitutional arrangement by which very big issues of this nature are indeed subject to a referendum. But I think there's a further point at stake, which is a matter of consent. The original legislation was passed by a very large majority of parliament, but with no discussion and with no serious analysis of the costs. If we are going to commit ourselves to costs that are probably in excess of 5% of GDP for the next 30 years, we really ought to have an active consent, not a passive yeah. virtue signaling. Yeah, because Stanley, Stanley, Johnson, Stanley Johnson, we were hoodwinked, weren't we? This was just slipped into the Conservative Party manifesto. There was no genuine public debate. Labour didn't have any debate over it. The British public had no idea what they were. Well, hold on. This is going to change our lives. Hold on, folks. I can remember way back in 2008, and 2008, the Labour government was in power. The Labour government introduced for the first time a target, a climate change target in our national legislation. It was the Climate Act of 2008. So it would be wrong to say this has not been a political issue. It has been a political issue now for 20, almost 20. Almost but Stanley, 20, can I give you an example? Can I give you an example, Stanley? The other day, you caused quite a lot of consternation on a GB News program with my great colleague Nana Aquir, because you pointed out that something British folk might have to commit to, in part of the march to net zero, is no longer being able to fly. I mean, we haven't consented to such a dramatic change to our way of life, have we? Go back to. Go back to Plato, if you like. I mean, Plato's line was ruled by the wisest, and I'm not saying we should have a Platonic structure of government. But I do think there are some unbelievably complex issues where it is right to say we have an electoral system, we have parliamentary elections, parties discuss things, they reach manifestos, those commitments come forward in the manifestos, they are endorsed by the electorate, not necessarily a majority of, of all the population, but certainly... But the even, electric, Stanley, but, but let's think about the realistic changes to our life. Even if that means we can no longer fly to a family holiday, even if that means we're no longer able to eat meat, even if that means we're no longer able to own and drive a car, I think when you actually put the practical reality to the British public, they realise, hold on a minute, this isn't what we voted for. As Gordon says, this isn't what we consented to. Well, I think you have a very low opinion of the British British public, Dan. You really do. I do believe that when the British public gets absolutely 
aware of the situation, as indeed it is increasingly aware of the situation, I think you will find there are increasing numbers of people who are willing not to fly, who are willing not to eat meat, who are willing not to build, you know, power. Well, I'm not willing to do park. any of that, Gordon Hughes, hmm? are you? Yeah. And if, in, and if, indeed. And I, I mean, uh, Stanley goes back to 2008 and the original legislation. The point is that the costs rise very, very sharply as you go up above the kind of levels that were set then to net zero. And that's really the issue. It's not that we do nothing about climate change, but whether we should go all of the way and bear these extraordinarily high costs and burden on our way of life. And as I well, said... I the issue is genuine public consent. Okay. Final word to you, Stanley. Final word for me. I don't want to be uh, arguing at one side of the economics or another, but I do feel very strongly that people like Professor Das Gupta and Dieter Helm have done a huge amount of work on environment economics, and they have pointed out that in the long run, the economic positives far outweigh the negatives. Okay.